Thanks everyone for having me here. Um, so I'm here today to present you a talk about the reactor game development. Um, so first of all, uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I love creating things and I love JavaScript. Uh, and one of my projects is actually an old school kind of RPG engine and game, which is built entirely with JavaScript. Um, and of course React is a core dependency of that engine and game, which is why I'm here today. Um, along with 3JS and uh, NWJS, which is a node web kit, it's very similar to Electron. Um, so first things I want to ask is, uh, can, you, can you just raise your hand up in the room if you identify yourself as a web developer? It's pretty much everyone, yeah. So, okay, you didn't keep your hand, but can you raise your hands up again if you also identify yourself as a game developer? Okay. So yeah, as I expected, like a few of them, but like a lot less game developers than web developers. Um, and that's kind of why I sort of arrived at this kind of structure for the talk today, um, which obviously I structured as a JSX component, as you do. Um, and the reason I did it like this was because I wanted to take you all on a similar, albeit much less painful journey that I went on to get to where I am. Um, and so hopefully by the end of the talk, you will have the context that you kind of need to kind of understand the crazy stuff that I'm talking about. Um, so let's get into it. Um, the first part of the talk, I'm going to talk about just game development in general. So for the people in the audience who have already sort of made games and stuff, just, just bear with me. Hopefully there'll be some stuff in here maybe you don't know, or if you do know it, then maybe you can tell me I'm, I'm wrong at the end of the talk or something like that. So the first thing uh, that will happen when you say, I want to make a game, is people will say, Unreal, or Unity. Um, that's basically because these, these are really, really well-established game development engines. Um, they're basically the industry standard, um, and they, they, they do basically form the sort of foundation for the multi-billion dollar game industry, amongst other game engines. Um, of course, there's you know, big companies that have their own custom engines, but Unity and Unreal are like really well established. And they're really highly complex tools with deeply integrated GUIs. Um, they take a significant amount of time to learn and master. Um, and they're typically written in like low level languages, they're statically typed languages, and they're compiled languages, like C++. I'm pretty sure both those frameworks are both written in C++. Um, and they often have their own kind of abstracted scripting languages for anything beyond basic functionality, which is another kind of thing that you have to learn if you, if you really want to make games with them and do anything beyond like basic functionality. But, you know, when, you, when you're talking about making games, and, and as, as a programmer, as a curious programmer, um, you, you start to think, like, what do these engines actually do? Well, what they do is that they provide a really well-developed, albeit monolithic abstraction layer to assist you in creating games. And of course, that's highly attractive for game companies with staff turnover, you know, cross-functional teams, um, and it's a large reason for their popularity. You know, you've got you know developers coming in and coming out. You've got new projects starting. You don't want to be able to put people onto the projects and have a really you know small footprint in, in upskilling and stuff like that. Um, so, why am I saying this? Is because when you think about using JavaScript in React for game development, it really helps to understand what's going on under the hood in these really sort of high profile game engines. Because if you're gonna be using React and JavaScript to make games, you're gonna be doing a lot of that stuff yourself. So I'm gonna just move into the next topic here, which is patterns. And these are game programming patterns. Um, I'm not gonna be able to talk about all the patterns because there's a ton of them. But if you want to learn more about game programming patterns, there's a really cool free book that you can look at online. It's gameprogrammingpatterns.com. And you can go and look at those patterns and, and, and learn more about it. It's really good, it's really informative, it's not like over the top. It's pretty good. And surprise, there's heaps of crossover between game development patterns and web development patterns, which is something I didn't know about before I kind of got into this. And it was really you know, interesting for me to find out how many sort of parallels there were. So I'm going to be focusing on some patterns which I found really helpful in building my engine and building my game. So hopefully they, they'll, they'll be helpful for you if you're, if you're curious about React for game development or JavaScript for game development. The first pattern I want to talk about is the game loop. Um, now the game loop is a pattern that is almost certainly in almost every single game you've ever played. And the easiest way for me to explain this pattern to you is think of Earth as a game and you're a character in that game. 
Now, the trees move with the wind, the sun rises and sets. These things occur without any input from you or any input from anyone else in the world. And if you think about that in a programming kind of context, what's happening is the tree objects and the sun objects are being re-rendered every unit of time. That's why they're moving, right? It's just like an animation. And that's what the game loop is doing in a game. It's updating the game world generally every second. So if you're a gamer, you've probably heard about this term of FPS, or frames per second, but that's what this is describing. It's how many frames per second the game world is updating. And obviously when you talk about really high frame, frame per second games, like 60 FPS, you often hear about that. That costs a lot of computational power for, for you know, really high fidelity games because obviously the graphics are you know, really good and the computer needs to be really powerful to be able to update that for 60 frames per second. So I'm going to switch to some code examples here, which I've presented in Adam. So I'm going to look, take a quick look at how you would implement the game loop pattern in JavaScript really simply. So here you've got uh, just a simple animation frame variable, you know, loop function, which takes in the world which we've imported, and a timestamp. And the first thing we do inside the loop function is just update the world and pass the timestamp through. We then assign the animation frame to the result of the uh, request animation frame function, which is really you know core to implementing a game loop in JavaScript. The request animation frame function passes through a high resolution timestamp to the callback function, which it takes as an argument. And what we're going to do here is we pass the loop in again. So you can see here that what's going to happen is it's going to just keep looping. It's going to keep passing the world in, it's going to keep passing the high res timestamp in, and that's how you get to your game loop. A really simple start method here, which, you know, if there isn't an animation frame yet, then we can start the loop. And there's a stop function here, which will say, you know, if there isn't an animation frame yet, we've got nothing to stop, so we're going to just return out. Um, but if there is, then we're going to cancel the animation frame, which we set above, and we're going to set it back to null. Then we just call the start function. So that, that will basically set up a game loop pattern for you in JavaScript. You know, really simple. I'm going to show you like a React implementation of this a bit later, but I want to just keep to pure JavaScript just for this point at the top. So that's the, that's the game loop. The next pattern I want to talk about is the state machine pattern. As many, many types of state machines, um, the three most common ones are finite state machines, hierarchical state machines, and pushed out automata. I'm not gonna go into all of these today. I'm basically, for simplicity, I'm just gonna talk about the finite state machines. Um, and in the world of software, you know, a finite state machine is a pro program, programming device that ensures that an application which has a finite number of states can only be in one of these states at any one time. And remember what I said about you know, game development patterns and web development patterns and there being some similarity? Well, check out the router example here. Really simple, you know, it's React Route 3, I think. I don't know, it keeps changing. But this is the markup. Um, <laughs> and, and, and basically, you know, we all know this, right? If you work with React Router, you know, you know what this is about. You've got a router component, you've got a, a, a you know, the first route is the index route, you've got a component, an app component that gets rendered at that, that route. And you've got three components on an app, and then underneath that, that, that render for the, the routes that are supplied, the login route, the, the log out route, and the sign up route. So really simple. So from this example, we like, you know, the behavior is really clear. When you're on the login route, you won't be able to sign up. You know, that the state machine says that no, you, you can't perform this functionality at, on that route. You can only do what the login component allows you to do, and the route, like the router or the or finite state machine is, you know, ensures that this is this is gonna be true. Okay, that's Redux. So if you're a Redux dev, if you work with Redux, which probably a lot of people, put, put your hand up if you work with Redux. Yeah, so like, heaps of people. Yeah, so React devs might see something, you know, Redux devs might see something familiar here, and you, you're absolutely right. Reduces are basically state machines. You know, the actions are fired to change application state, and reduces are state machines that manage the change of the state, right? So it's another example of how common, you know, game dev patterns are being used in a project you might be working on today or you've worked on in the past that you'll 
work on in the future. The next thing I'm going to talk about is OOP, right? Okay, so it's kind of a bit blasphemous in some React circles today to talk about OOP because everyone's all about FP. But honestly, like OOP is like game development's chosen choice of how to do things. Um, and there's a reason for this, right? You know, immutability is great for fault tolerant web applications. We've all learned this through using React and through using Redux. But it, it's not so great for like really rich 3D worlds where the cost of mutating objects to yield true performance benefits over time. You know, if you, if you think about it, if you've got a really complex 3D model and someone you want to move your arm from here to here, if you're using functional programming and you're duplicating that object every single time and you know creating a new one, it's going to get very expensive. So, so this is why functional programming hasn't had as much of a kind of drive in, in game development as it has in the web, web development world, because what we deal with in, as web developers is you know much simpler than what a game developer deals with. We don't have to worry about GPU performance, for example. Um, but if your game is really simple, then function, functional programming might be totally fine. Like if it's just a really simple 2D game, then it, it's probably going to be fine. You're probably not going to get a notice. So it's something to think about. So then we come to JavaScript. And should you do it? Should you really be using JavaScript to make a game? And you will ask yourself this many, many times, as I have, um, while I went on this journey. Um, it's a, it's a valid question. Um, one of the main reasons why I chose to use JavaScript to make games is because I wanted to stick to what I knew. I didn't want to throw away all my web development experience and invest all my time into learning Unity, Unreal, C++, for example. But, you know, if you only want to make games, you, you might want to consider this. If that's your dream, if you want to be a game developer, maybe, maybe you should learn Unity or, or Unreal. You know, JavaScript is great. We, we all love JavaScript. We have Sydney Meetup, but yeah, it's, it's great. But there are roadblocks and there are limitations. Um, they're not prohibitive, but it is challenging, right? And, and we'll talk a bit about WASM here because WASM does make this whole proposition kind of weighted towards mm, maybe maybe this is not such a good idea, but you know that's a topic for another talk. Um, but remember that you can if you build a game with JavaScript, it's probably the only language where you can you know cheaply. I say cheaply because if you want to do it with Unity, it costs money. It's, you can cheaply re you know, release for browser, desktop, mobile quite easily, and, and that's something others can't do. And it is still, I think, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it is the, the one language where you can really code once and release everywhere. And that, that, is, that is a pretty big pro, right? So I'll, I'll really briefly talk about you know, JavaScript frameworks for you know, building games. There isn't really an enterprise level game engine written in JavaScript yet that comes to the same level as like something like Unity or Unreal. When I say that, I mean that Unity and Unreal have like really complex GUIs. Like it's like Photoshop for making games, right? It's like, you know, it's, a, it's an enterprise level product. There's nothing like that for JavaScript yet, really. Um, some frameworks give you some really nice, a really nice set of APIs and patterns and architectural templates that you can use. And, and some of these are Phaser. Which is pretty popular, um, PixieJS um, and Play Canvas. Now, Play Canvas is pretty new. It's only been out for a little while, um, and it, it, it does seem to be kind of trying to fill that role of like a proper game engine written in JavaScript, and it supports WebGL for 3D graphics. When I say a proper game engine, it has a G, it has like a GUI where you can sort of have an interface for actually how you would make the game. Um, and it is being used by companies like Disney and Nickelodeon to make games. Like I've seen. If you go onto their website, you can see you like some examples. So that's pretty cool. Let's talk about React. So I'm going to split this part into two, two different bits. Um, basically, like how are other people using React for game dev? How I'm using React for game dev? And, and, and the sort of distinction arises here between sort of DOM and SVG games versus WebGL based games, in my opinion. And, but no matter which path you take, if you, if you want to do this, you're going to end up building a lot of your engine from scratch because it's simply not there yet. People just haven't done the work for you um, like they have in you know, other parts of web development. One thing I did find in my travels um, was this pretty cool library. It's pretty recent. Um, I think the guy made some commits to it a really long time ago and then didn't add to it and then has been making kind of steady commits to it over the last six months. 
It's really well written and nicely structured. It's, a, it's an excellent starting point for writing a game with React. It's called, it's called React Game Kit. It's the same guys who did Victory. I don't know if you've used Victory charts before, but it's a pretty cool charting library. Um, and it has game development patterns like the ones I talked about before built in, like the game loop. So let's, let's just have a look at how that's implemented and go back to the code example and add them there. So this is pretty similar to the pure JavaScript implementation of a game loop that I showed you before. It's got one extra kind of feature. Um, it's a class, it's an ES6 class obviously. Um, and it has uh, this, this array property on it called subscribers. Um, basically that is a way for the, this engine React game, crit, game kit to kind of have functions subscribe to the game loop. So you can see this loop method here, it, it loops through all the subscribers and it's just functions. And it'll, it'll always call a function, um, every loop. So if there's a, there's a function subscribed to the game loop, when the game loop runs, it'll, it'll call it. Again, this is really similar to in my earlier example I had, um, you know, had the animation frame variable. In this class, you've just got a loop ID, it's the same thing. Um, and you've got a start method and a stop method. I think there's a bug in the stop method, but I'm gonna go into that now. Um, and you've got a subscribe and unsubscribe uh, method on the class, which will obviously plug a callback function into the subscribe list and then like, get rid of it. So that, it's really simple, right? Like it's what? 36 lines of code, and that's basically done for you in the in, in React Game Kit. Um, so, as I said before, I'm going to show you like a React implementation of how to how to use a game loop like this. And, and thankfully, React Game Kit has actually done this for you. Um, so, if you have a look at this, this is obviously a React component here. It's a loop component, and really simple. It imports the game loop from a, from the utils module. Um, and you just go through, and in the constructor, all they're doing is just instantiating a new game loop. In a component did mount, and a component will unmount, you've got the start and stop methods, which seems quite logical, right? We're starting the loop, we're gonna start it. We've got rid of the loop component, we're gonna stop the loop. These guys use context, which is really similar to, to Redux, and there's a bit of documentation about that that I'm gonna talk about in a second. So basically, Um, the documentation describes the loop component it acts much like a Redux provider in that it passes a game loop instance down to the component tree by this context loop, and this allows you to subscribe and unsubscribe to the main game loop anywhere in your component tree. So it's, it's pretty handy. So let's have a look at this in action and what this can do. So basically what these guys have done is they've taken the, um, the game kit and they've made a tutorial and they've made the tutorial in the game kit. So I don't know if this sounds, give me a second. tutorial for the game, for the game engine, and they've made it in the game engine itself. So you can walk into these little doors here, and it will tell you stuff about the game engine and how it works. It's like a tutorial. 
and you can go through this yourself later on, but I can just yeah, jump around here and stuff. So yeah, it's a really simple oh, way. <laughs> Alright, so that's that's basically how an, an example of, you know, it's obviously a very simple example, but React Game Kit does give you some really cool tools to be able to make games, and obviously you can see, if you can ext extrapolate from that, like it'd be pretty easy to make Super Mario Brothers with the engine, like it's not hard to imagine how that would work. So it, it gives you a really good starting point if you do want to get started with using React to make games. So there is some main code that is used to drive that, but I wanted to talk about that and just show you sort of what that looks like. Because this is this is the thing when you play in React, you've got this really nice declarative kind of way to do things. <coughs> this is just the main render function from the game, the main game sort of component that that runs that demo that you just saw. And if you look at that, like it's just so simple. You know, you've got a you've got a loop, you get a stage, you've got a world, you've got a level and a character. And if you look at how the code is structured for other game engines and how they do things, this is really nice. It's, it's just really clear and really simple and you can you can follow declaratively like what's going on. So this is just an example of how, you know, using React for game development does give you that really nice sort of way to kind of build a game in a nice declarative fashion. And if you use something like React Game which is sort of giving you a starting point to do that from, it, it, it could be, you know, quite a nice experience. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about my own experience um, in using React for game development now. Um, my engine is called Goldstream Engine because it's inspired by a classic, uh, the kind of classic Goldbox series of Dungeons and Dragons games and Final Fantasy Tactics. Really old school, back in the 80s. If you were playing games like that, you might know what I'm talking about. You're old like me. <laughs> so um, basically, yeah, that, that's why I called it that. In my engine, um, React is only used for UI, right? Like all the other game logic is actually decoupled from the UI. And is handled by pure JavaScript and, and, and 3JS for rendering. If there's any 3D graphics involved, you know the way I've done it is that um, if a game state needs UI, um, when it when it activates, it mounts that UI. It provides data to the UI, and when it unmounts it, you know, and un it un when, it un when it deactivates, it'll unmount that UI. Right? Um, and the components manage their own state, so I'm not using Redux. Um, the components manage their own state. I found that to be, for me, a, a better solution for what I was doing, because um, I wasn't dealing with like uh, a global store of data um, for, for, for the UI, basically. Um, and game modules are separated out logically. Every game module is separated out from sort of separation of concerns. And you can see from this screenshot here, I'm not sure if everyone can see that, but basically there's a combat module, for example, and you can see that inside that combat module there's some sub-modules, actions, AI, constants, map, system. So the combat system stuff is in there, the 3D map is in there. And there's a UI module. All the components in that UI module are done with React. So I'm gonna show you a really, like just a screenshot at first for a tool, the tool set in the game engine. So the tool set is something that I use to create in-game assets, um, such as levels or combat scenarios. It's been the main focus of my development so far because without the tool set, I won't be able to actually make games easily. It will take me a long time. So just a disclaimer that all the sprites here are actually the property of Square Enix. Um, they're being used for prototyping purposes only, right? I haven't, I haven't the, all the codes mine, but the sprites and stuff, they're all, they're all ripped from the web, right? So basically this is what my, my tool set looks like. Um, all the React components are just um, sort of highlighted in yellow. So, so basically, you've got a you got a file menu. There's a toolbar on the left hand side, and the unit inspector component is on the left hand side. I'm going to talk about. I'm going to demo that actually live in the engine in a little bit. And you've just got a little um, sort of text field up here, which is actually the elevation for the unit. It's currently saying zero because he hasn't moved, but once he moves, it'll it'll update. So, so basically, you can see here from this view, you've got this main part of the screen that's all rendered by 3JS. React has nothing to do with that part of the screen, but React does have everything to do with the two-dimensional UI. And I've, I've decoupled the UI from the from the game engine so that when you do stuff with the UI, I, I kind of use a Redux-like system that it dispatches an action, and the game state gets informed of what's what's happened and updates the, the game based on that. 
So I'm going to show you a code example of how the what that looks like. So that 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 tool set that you just saw, this is all the code that runs that. I'm literally just importing some some sub tools and just rendering that out. And that's that's the code for the for the tool set interface right there. Really simple. Obviously, those sub components have a lot more code in them, but you know, just really really quite simple. So now I'm going to just give you a bit of a demo for the actual unit inspector that I, that I showed just then. The unit inspector is like an internal debugging tool for me. Um, and I, I debug the actions of combat units through the unit inspector. So if I add a new feature, like a unit can jump, or a unit can move from water to lava, or, or something like that. Um, I'll, put, I'll put that into the unit inspector, and that, that'll let me debug if there's any problems or something with that particular feature. So let's have a look at that. So I've got a component up here, which you might be able to see that's, all this stuff is powered by reactor dragging function and everything. So if I want to move this guy somewhere, I can select the tile over here and I'll move there. Um, some of the stuff that I've done through React is just textual feedback. So when a unit gets damaged, you know, or buffed, you see some text appear above them. This, this, this textual feedback is actually powered by Anime.js, which is a really cool animation library, which is why I through through React and stuff like that to work properly. Um, so I can, I can sort of demonstrate sort of, you know, if, if he dodges or whatever, what that looks like. So that's all plugged in. Um, there's also an, an actions menu. The actions menu is done in React as well because it's 2D UI. So that'll appear when it's, when it's the, you know, the unit's turn, basically. Um, and so just to close out, just give you a look at So this is just a combat encounter running now. There's an AI going on and these guys will like attack each other and stuff. I think we get some player turns in here as well. This is all built with JavaScript and React, basically. <coughs> so I can move this guy. Oh, one. <laughs> so there you go. That's it. Okay. Question about React itself. Yeah. So React you can use to do two D games, maybe some three D games if you mix it with some YGLs. Yeah, like that. yeah. What about virtual reality? So I've heard yeah. something about I, React. I, I, I personally like I, I personally haven't looked into it, but there is I think a React kit for for, for doing VR with React. So yeah, they're definitely uh, providing tools for people to be able to do that. So I'd say yes. If, we, if, you, if you want to do VR stuff, then yeah, check it out. I think it's called React VR, actually. So um, just check it out. I'm, 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 it's, it's sort of already out there. So yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. I'll just yeah. Um, what's your choice for two D games? Uh, you mean what engine? What what's yeah, it, yeah. Which one I choose? Um, If, you, if you're not scared of doing a bit custom, I'd maybe give React Game Kit a go, right? But if you want to have like a fully fledged kind of framework that's already done for you, go Pixie. Pix Pixie's like, uh, not Pixie, sorry, um, the first one, Phaser. Phaser. Phaser's really quite fully featured and it's it's been used in a couple of games. I actually think that a couple of people have released games on Steam uh, through Phaser. Um, that package
package that up through Electron um, as a, a you know, Windows executable or a Mac DNG and they release it on Steam. So you can totally do that. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, Face is a pretty good choice. Yeah. yeah. Have you tested how big you can make this world, like the, the test that you made? Like yeah. How big it would be, how many characters you can have? You mean like performance? Yeah, and then you don't hit the same performance. Look, for me, the maps in my game currently are not super huge, right? Like I've done a test where I've done a level twice the size of that and filled the whole thing with units, right? And it ran okay, it was fine. Um, I did, it depends what system you're running it on. Like I've got a MacBook Pro and it doesn't have a super great GPU, right? Um, but on this MacBook Pro, it, it runs fine, no problem. Um, I did try running it on a MacBook Air, um, which was from 2011 and it chugged. Yeah, it, it didn't cope very well, but you can't game on that machine anyway. Like you, you try to run any kind of game that's past like 2005 and that, that computer's gonna chug. So yeah, I think it's quite relative. I, I mean, obviously it's, it's a JavaScript game, right? It's gonna, it's gonna hit your RAM quite hard, quite a bit harder than say a game built with, you know, under, under the hood in C++ or something like that. And you are gonna get some performance impacts. But I think that, that can kind of be offset by your, sort of goals with the game. Like, I think that for like a retro kind of game, JavaScript is actually quite fine. It's an okay choice. But if you want to make like, you know, triple A type games, no, it's not the right choice. Yeah. Anyone? No. Thanks very much.